Welcome back. In this tutorial, we're going to dive further into the microservice architecture, going over the three most commonly used design patterns in a microservice architecture. We'll start with the database per service. We'll then talk about the API gateway pattern, and we'll wrap up with the event-driven architecture pattern. If this sounds good, let's not waste time and dive in. Let us start with the database per service pattern. This pattern aims to achieve loose coupling between microservices by providing each service with its own dedicated database. This approach enhances service independence, scalability, and data encapsulation. Conceptually, each microservice manages its own private database, accessible only by that service. This enforces clear boundaries and promotes the single responsibility principle. Key aspects of this pattern include data isolation. Each service's data is isolated reducing dependencies between services. Technology flexibility. Services can utilize different database technologies tailored to their specific needs. Independent scaling. Databases can be scaled independently based on the requirements of each service. Simplified development. Developers can concentrate on a single service and its data model without worrying about impacts on other services. However, as with any design pattern, challenges exist. The first challenge is data duplication. Redundant data across services can lead to consistency issues. Next, we encounter complex cross-service queries. Joining data from multiple services becomes difficult and may require additional patterns, such as API composition. Another challenge is transaction management. As you decouple your data into different data stores, you lose the inherent data integrity provided by traditional RDBMS. Ensuring data consistency across services without distributed transactions can be challenging. Additionally, there is increased operational complexity. Managing multiple databases can be more challenging than overseeing a single shared database. We also need to be aware of common mistakes to avoid. For instance, overusing the pattern. Applying this pattern unnecessarily to small services or tightly coupled domains can lead to increased complexity without significant benefits. Next is neglecting data migration. Failing to plan for data migration when splitting a monolithic database into separate service databases can create issues. Lastly, ignoring eventual consistency. Not designing systems to handle eventual consistency between services can result in data inconsistencies. Now, let's explore how this pattern translates into real-world applications. In the previous video, we adapted a monolithic e-commerce platform into a microservices architecture. Today, we'll build on that foundation by applying the database per service pattern. Our current architecture consists of four main services, the product service, inventory service, shopping cart service, and order tracking service. Before implementing the database per service pattern, it's crucial to have a solid understanding of both your business processes and your data. Simply put, if you don't have a good handle on your business processes, you won't be able to define clear boundaries between the microservices. And if you don't govern your data, if you don't know its sources and who uses it, it's just unwise to apply this pattern. Doing so will likely exacerbate existing issues. To proceed effectively, the first step is to initiate a data governance program. I encourage you to check out the introductory videos I published earlier on this topic. Now, assuming you have a good handle on your data, you should be able to clearly identify which service is responsible for creating data and which services consume it. In this example, the product service owns the product and category tables. The inventory service owns the inventory and location tables. The shopping cart service owns the cart and card items tables. And the order tracking service owns the order, order item, and order status tables. With this understanding, you can begin splitting your database schema into smaller, specialized databases that will be managed independently by each service. Now, let's examine how we can split our initial database schema to ensure each microservice owns and manages its data exclusively. In this design, I want to emphasize that services become loosely coupled, without any shared databases. This architecture allows for significant flexibility in database technology choices, tailored to each service's specific requirements. For instance, one service might leverage MongoDB or DynamoDB for its NoSQL capabilities. Pushing this decoupling even further, we could host services across different cloud providers, utilizing Azure Cosmos DB or Google Cloud Data Store for NoSQL needs. Granted, this will be expansive, 
But, the crucial principle to understand with this pattern is that data access occurs solely through each service's API, maintaining strong encapsulation. This pattern not only enhances scalability and flexibility but it also allows teams to optimize each service's data layer independently. Okay, let's move on to our next design pattern. And our next pattern is the API Gateway pattern, which serves as a single entry point for client requests in a microservices ecosystem. Its primary purposes are 1. To simplify the client side code by providing a unified interface. 2. To handle cross-cutting concerns like authentication, logging, and rate limiting. 3. To aggregate responses from multiple microservices. 4. To provide protocol translation and API versioning. The API Gateway acts as a reverse proxy, intercepting all incoming API calls from clients. It then routes these requests to appropriate microservices, aggregates the responses, and returns them to the client. The gateway can also perform additional functions such as authentication and authorization, request and response transformation, caching, monitoring and analytics, and rate limiting and throttling. That said, let's talk about the challenges associated with this pattern. First, performance bottleneck. If not properly designed, the API gateway can become a single point of failure and a performance bottleneck. Ensure proper scaling and caching mechanisms are in place. Second, over complexity. Adding too much business logic to the API gateway can make it difficult to maintain and scale. Keep the gateway focused on routing, aggregation, and cross cutting concerns. Then, there's a lack of versioning. Failing to implement proper API versioning can lead to breaking changes for clients. Implement a robust versioning strategy from the start. Next is the inadequate monitoring. Not implementing comprehensive monitoring and alerting can make it difficult to troubleshoot issues. Ensure proper logging and monitoring are in place. There are also challenges generated from security misconfigurations. Incorrectly implementing authentication and authorization can lead to security vulnerabilities. Regularly audit and test security configurations. And finally, we have tight coupling. Designing the API gateway with too much knowledge of the underlying microservices can lead to tight coupling. Strive for loose coupling to maintain flexibility. By addressing these challenges and avoiding common mistakes, organizations can effectively implement the API gateway pattern to enhance their microservices architecture. Let's now apply this pattern to our e-commerce solution. And obviously, it starts with the clients of our microservice solution. The API gateway intercepts all incoming API calls from clients and routes them to the appropriate microservices before aggregating the responses and returns them to the client. And, as mentioned, within the gateway, we can take care of authentication, secret management, and HTTP and protocol translations. Last, if you think about implementation options for this pattern, you can look at AWS API Gateway, Azure Azure API Management, or Google Cloud Endpoints and Apogee Edge. Next on the menu is the event-driven architecture pattern. The primary purpose of this pattern is to enable loosely coupled, scalable, and responsive systems that can react to changes in real time. It aims to improve system flexibility, scalability, and fault tolerance by allowing components to communicate asynchronously through events. An event-driven architecture is built on the idea of producing, detecting, consuming, and reacting to events. An event represents a significant change in state or an important occurrence within a system. More precisely, event producers generate events when something notable happens. These events are transmitted through an event channel or message broker. The event consumers subscribe to relevant events and react accordingly. This approach allows for decoupled systems where components don't need direct knowledge of each other, promoting modularity and easier system evolution. On the other hand, there are a few challenges to be aware of. First, as systems evolve, managing and versioning event schemas can become complex. This pattern often relies on eventual consistency, which can be challenging to handle in certain use cases requiring immediate consistency. Another challenge is ensuring the correct order of events, especially in distributed systems. This can be very difficult. Next is to overuse of events. Indeed, not every interaction needs to be event-driven. Don't unnecessarily increase complexity by only considering events as your mean to integrate your microservices. 
A common mistake with this pattern is to fail to establish standard event formats across the organization can lead to integration difficulties. Another mistake is to ignore persisting important events, which can result in critical data loss and system inconsistencies. Finally, the last two common mistakes can apply to all patterns, failing to implement proper error handling and not considering the ability to debugging issues in a distributed system. If you cannot trace your events, it'll be complex to troubleshoot your system. Okay, let's now apply EDA to our e-commerce solution. Let's front our services with a message broker. And, let's consider the scenario that an end user places an order via the shopping cart. The shopping cart service will send a notification to the message broker asking for getting the product information currently in the cart. The product service subscribing to the get product info message will act and respond to the request, publishing a product info message for the shopping cart to consume. The shopping cart will then want to confirm the quantity, and once confirmed, create the order. Pretty cool, right? Now, in AWS, you can implement this pattern using Amazon Event Bridge or Amazon Simple Notification Service and Simple Queue Service. Google Cloud offers similar options with Cloud Pub, Sub, and Cloud Functions to process the events. And Azure provides the Azure Event Grid, Azure Service Bus, and Azure Functions. Okay. I think I need a tiny break. So, if you don't mind, let me wrap up today's video, refill my cup of coffee, and in the next tutorial, I'll continue our discussions on the most commonly used design patterns in a microservice architecture. Specifically, we'll talk about the different approaches to implement the service registry and discovery design pattern. We'll also talk about the circuit breaker pattern which is critical to detect failures and prevent cascading failures in such architecture. But most importantly, we'll bring together these five patterns to visualize what a microservice architecture actually is. Swell, right? So, please, stay tuned, and subscribe if you'd like to get notified when the next tutorial is published. And on that note, see you soon.